I'm here with George Spaeth. George, you are participating in a discussion about whether patients with pre-parametric glaucoma should be treated. Now, before we we discuss um, what 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 the what the possibilities are, what the choices are, what the contexts are, let me ask you to to define just briefly what what is pre-parametric glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma has changed the definition, changed dramatically over the time, as you know, Josh. But I think most people think of glaucoma now as damage to the optic nerve retinal nerve fiber layer, damage to the ganglion cells, in some way related to pressure. Uh, it has characteristic appearance and it tends to get worse. So it's, it's no longer pressure definition or other things like that. It's damage to the neural tissue related to pressure. I think that's probably the simplest definition. And by, by by pre-parametric, you uh, mean patients who, who've not yet show, who, well, not no, exactly yet. right. Who, no, pa but patients exactly who don't right. show visual field. So you loss. look at them and you say this patient has an optic nerve on the right, which is looks as though it's probably damaged. And you look at the nerve on the left and you think, oh, that's a perfectly normal nerve. And then you see that the pressure in the right eye is 60 and the pressure in the left eye is 20. Well, you know that they have something that we call glaucoma, but they don't have any visual field loss. That's right. So that's what people think of as pre-parametric glaucoma. The assumption is they will get field loss. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to ask what's going to sound like a very simple question, which is, should they be treated? Well, that answers, the answer to that is based on, will they get field loss that's sufficiently intense that it's going to influence their quality of life and give them a disability. So that's the question. And uh, so there's a lot of interest in how do you tell when a person's in what you presume is an early stage of glaucoma, or let's just say even more generally that you're not even sure they have glaucoma, they just have ocular hypertension. That is to say pressure above normal. Let's say you've got pressure of 28 in both eyes. Should they get treated? Well, the reason why you would treat them is because you think that you're going to prevent them from getting some sort of decrease in quality of life or disability. But the question is, how do you know who's going to develop that? So people develop risk calculators and things like that, such as, well, if they're of black ethnic origin, or if they have a family history, or if they've got a thin central cornea, sure. then those people are at higher risk. Now, the complicating factor is they are at higher risk, but it still doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that the particular person you're talking about is ever going to get worse, is ever going to get worse. For example, if you take a population of people, all of whom have thin central corneas, 500, something like that or less, and what people would consider, by and large, significantly elevated intraocular pressure, more than three standard deviations, uh, 27. The ocular hypertension treatment study showed that one-third of those patients with thin central corneas and elevated pressures will get field loss. You look at the other way around, two-thirds won't. Well, let's just concentrate on the two-thirds that won't for the moment. If you treat those people, you're going to make them worse. Because every treatment makes somebody worse. It gives them their, if they have ocular surface disease and they're going to live for 30 years, they're going to end up, I mean, if they have a, if they have a good life expectancy and they end up uh, with ocular surface disease because you treat them for 30 years, you haven't done much of a favor. And virtually everybody that gets treated with a preservative containing eye drop is going to end up with ocular surface disease at the end of 30 years. Just starting them on a drop decreases the quality of their life, been shown very clearly. Just the need to use it, their quality of life is already hampered. The inconvenience, the expense, and we have a medical system which is unsustainable because it's so expensive. So very serious downsides to treating patients. Ocular hypertension treatment study, other studies too also showed the patients who are on glaucoma medications for a considerable period of time are more likely to get cataract. 
So these are not harmless things you're doing. So my thought is you have to know that this particular person, not a population, but this person who you're dealing with, they're sitting in a chair right in front of you, is going to develop a decreased quality of life or a disability. Now, how, how do you judge this? I mean, is this... Uh, is it simply a uh, a matter of the of the patient's age of the of the patient's health that you're saying? Well, you know, even if this patient loses nerve at this rate, you know that 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 they're never going to get to the point where they're going to have symptomatic field loss. I mean, is that the sort of well, sort of calculus it. that you're but talking about? Josh, what I like to do is I have a a graphic way of looking at this myself and a graphic way of showing that to the patient. There's some way I can demonstrate that here? Well, you know, we're actually, as you and I are speaking, that graph is showing up on the, oh, on great. the screen. Oh, wonderful. Well, you'll see there's a green top and a yellow middle and a red bottom. Patients in what I call the green zone do not yet have detectable visual field loss. In the yellow zone, they have visual field loss, but they don't know it. In other words, many people get visual field loss, but it doesn't bother them. Of course. And in the red zone, they have trouble in restaurants, they can't uh, walk on curbs anymore. I mean, they, they, they have some real problem. They're sick. They're diseased, diseased. But the people in the green zone, and that's probably 95% of the people we're considering, maybe they have a pressure of 27, or thin central cornea, or some disc asymmetry, the question is, how do you know they're going to get worse? You know they're going to get worse if they have a finding which is always associated with getting worse. Pressure, let's say, of 40 or higher. Or you have, uh, you have some sort of genetic magic marker. Now, myocillin is interesting that David Mackey published a paper recently and we published one about 10 years ago that showed that people who are, have a certain aspect of the myosin gene are more likely to be rapid progressors than people who are who don't have that but that doesn't but it's virtually useless in terms of diagnosis it just if they have that with something else then they but we're still not there genetics is not going to tell us at this point it may in the future so at this moment what can you say Definitely pressures which are in a range which always cause problems. That's one thought. And the other thing, and Joe Capriola has talked about this, many people have talked about this, you watch them and you determine what the rate of change is. So they're in the green zone, they have no field loss, and you see if they go from, I like to use a just damage likelihood scale because it's a far more accurate estimate of damage than cup disc ratios. And they have a just damage likelihood scale of one, which is as good as they can get. And then a year later, it's two. And a year later, it's three. And a year later, it's four. Well, they're getting worse. No, that's not true. They are not getting worse. Their disc is getting worse. They are just as healthy they, that person, is exactly as healthy with a disc damage likelihood scale of four as he was with one. From a, a quality of life standpoint? From, from any point of view they want to measure. The person has not gotten worse. The field has gotten worse, but who cares? They don't care. Uh, I, I, it, it doesn't influence them in any way. It doesn't decrease their quality of life. It doesn't give them a disability. So, yes, their disc has gotten worse, and if it continues to get worse long enough, then presumably they would get a decrease in quality of life. Well, I, I have some some questions from what what you've said. One is is that you know there, there's a, a a a trend and one to which I uh, I adhere firmly um, that I want to practice evidence based medicine and I want to practice based on guidelines from clinical studies that I trust. How am I going to be able to make a judgment 
based on a, a, a patient's context, his clinical context, his life context, that I'm going to feel comfortable with treating, aren't I... Um, Aren't I Let me discarding cut you off, because, the because I know guidance exactly where you're coming I'm, from? Yeah. Because yes, you are discarding it because you're discarding population guidelines. Probably the single no, let's take that a terribly serious error that physicians make consistently is generalizing from a population to an individual. You can't do that unless the generalization is always valid. So you can generalize that people, a population of people has pressures of 60, yes, they're going to get worse. Now you take a population of people with pressures of 28, you can say that population is more likely to get worse than a person, than a population with pressures of 15. But you look within that population and you say, this is Mrs. X and this is Mr. Y, there is no greater likelihood of Mr. X or Mrs. Y getting worse than the people with pressures 15. You can't, because you have no indicator in that group of, is Mr. X one of those people who's going to get worse and one who's not? You can't generalize that way. All you can say is the population is more likely to get worse, but who within that population, you don't know. Do you, do you, Discuss with with the with the patients that with glaucoma in particular that were managing based on probabilities that the, the vast majority of ophthalmologists who 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 read studies well everything is based on probability right but so what, do, do but you, what probabilities do you let them are you say what, 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 what but do you do you include the patient in the choices and say look uh, uh, you know this this is what we know about populations. How comfortable do, do you feel with this level of risk, with this level of risk, with that level of risk? Absolutely. The patient is the one that makes the decision. So you say, let's be very specific. You have a pressure of 28 in one eye and 26 in the other eye, and your optic nerves still look fine. You don't have any visual field loss. You're at greater risk for developing field loss than you are if you had pressures of 15. Don't forget, though, if I talk to you on treatment, you're probably at greater risk from the treatment you're getting than you are for developing disability from glaucoma. Sure, no, no, I understand that. I, uh, I, so, so they have to have that because if you simply give them the one side and give them this very, you know, every, every increase of pressure of one millimeter increases the likelihood they're going to get worse by 10%. That's one of the most malignantly wrong things that's ever been said regarding glaucoma. That's a terrible way to think about patient care because that doesn't, doesn't follow for that particular patient. George, if, if, if I were being treated, I would want to be treated by someone like you who viewed me, I'd want to be treated by you, uh, who, who would view me as, as a person rather than a member of a, of a population. But I want to say that from a cost standpoint, a societal cost standpoint, it is a valid point, I think, to say, well, you know, glaucoma, field loss, uh, symptomatic field loss uh, costs this in terms of days lost from work, in terms oh, of absolutely. therapy, and that that on a population level, that it that to to some extent it's acceptable to over treat, you know, to treat people who don't need treatment to keep the total cost low. I think it makes the cost higher, much higher, because you're over treating most of the people, you're giving them ocular surface disease, you're giving them all sorts of things that are gonna cost a lot of money, whereas if you don't treat them and they go from a DD less of one to a DD less of four, and they have a life expectancy where they're gonna live for four or five more years, better say estimated years for many, then you say to them, you know, I think there's a reasonable chance you're going to get into the red zone. Time to start treatment on you. Now, physicians are often uncomfortable with the idea that you have to have an idea of how long the person's going to live. Of course. They're uncomfortable with that. You have to have that. Otherwise, there's no rational basis for treatment. Now, let's say you take a person who's coming to see you and their pressures are... 
35 and they've got early field loss and definite disc damage, they're still asymptomatic from an ocular point of view. And they also tell you that they've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer of a very serious type and uh, their oncologist said they have a, maybe three months to live. You're going to treat that patient? You're crazy if you treat that patient. That's an extreme example. But let's say now that patient comes back to you six months later because you say, well, I want to see in six months and see how things are going. They come back to you six months later and they say, doctor, I have the best news. My oncologist said this new experimental drug has cured me. I don't have pancreatic cancer anymore. I'm, he thinks I'm cured. And you say, well, that's great. The good news is wonderful. The bad news is now we're going to start you on some treatment. Well, because in essence, they're a different patient. They're a different patient. And you have to make that evaluation each time you're making a decision as to whether to treat or not to treat, to change or not to change treatment. Georgia, I, I, um, I, have to, I have to tell you, I've enjoyed this conversation as much as anyone that I've ever spoken to in the context of these, of these interviews. I want to thank you personally, and I want to thank you for the time that you've spent with us today. Josh, thank you for having me. Delightful. <laughs>